So now we're in part two of the presentation, and that's safe solutions for fact checking. So now that we've talked about the state of the field, what are actionable strategies that you can do for managing your own personal well being? We'll start with managing your online safety and dealing with harassment. This is an overview of what you need to know to protect yourself and your mental health from online attacks. The first is safety, where it's important to craft an online safety plan. We're going to start with the basics and I'll share some online security resources that you can follow to do more due diligence. And then we'll go over managing harassment, starting with making checklists to prepare for harassment, making checklists to react to harassment, and creating an online environment that's sustainable for your mental health. So starting with online safety, what does it mean to build a security plan? It turns out there are a million things that you can do to maximize your digital safety, and trying to do all of them is impossible, or at least very difficult. So what you can do is use threat modeling to narrow down what you need to do specifically for yourself. And then you can build a security plan where you identify um, risk factors that are very specific to you and steps that you are able to take. A good way to start is by taking stock of your online presence and accounts. Do you have public social media accounts? Does your name appear alongside the fact checks that you write? By the way, I really recommend that you follow that link to start building your security plan in more detail. However, I also understand that you may be very busy, so we are going to go over the top three actions that you should take. Like I mentioned before, there are resources at the end of this presentation and in the document, and I very much recommend that you go look at them. So here are the top three actions that you should be taking if you don't have any time. The first is two-factor authentication. In this case, usually you first give them your password, but then you need to submit a second form of identification, which is usually a code that is generated and sent to your phone or an authorization app. The authorization apps are usually called Authy or Google Authenticator. That way, even if somebody has your password, they would also need to have access to your phone in order to get that code to access your account. The next is having strong and unique passwords across your accounts. Do not share a password across your accounts because if they get your password for one account, it means that they can log into your other accounts. I recommend that you use a password manager, which can actually generate and store your passwords for you. That way you do not have to reset your password every time you forget or come up with passwords that are too easy to guess. In the document, I have a section on generating strong passwords, uh, and there are two methods which is having four unusual words in a row uh, because it is easy to remember and hard to guess. The second method is more complicated where you come up with a sentence and use the first letter of each word in that sentence. Look at the document to get more details. The final thing is to go through the security steps offered by social media, often in your settings, and use maximum privacy settings. I think it's easy to overlook uh, all of the settings and the steps that they offer for you to maximize your security and privacy, but basically just do due diligence, go through privacy settings, go through the tutorials that they have. Gmail has some very, very important ones that you should do. And next, I just have a couple of habits that I think are really good to have for security purposes. The first is use a VPN, um, and that's basically kind of software that you can download that masks your information online so that people can't collect your information from websites. Um, and if you're using public Wi-Fi, that means people can't get your information. The next is do not post pictures or other info showing your geographic location. Make it very hard for people to find you. You'd be very surprised at how much information people post about themselves that it makes it very easy to stalk them on their social media so take a look at that and the last is be diligent about keeping all of your software up to date so on chrome you'll occasionally see that it requests an update in the top right hand corner a lot of your um, apps will prompt you to say hey do you want to update your app and you definitely should say yes this is because uh, many of the updates happen because a bug has been found or a security gap has been found and this is them patching it up. So this is a just a very good step for making sure that your security is as airtight as possible. And the next part is dealing with harassment and hate. And this is not just for your safety, but for your mental health. A lot of the time people kind of know what steps they should be taking to deal with harassment or they have 
theoretical strategies, but when you're actually being harassed, it is very hard to think of those things in the moment. So writing down a literal checklist is actually super important. So when I say have a plan, I mean have a plan on paper. Making a checklist makes it concrete to minimize the cognitive and emotional energy you have to spend on strategizing, and it helps you handle it as effectively and as quickly as possible. Another side effect is that it helps you prepare your friends and colleagues ahead of time because, you know, on your list, if it says have your friend help you, then you know that you should designate a friend who can't help you ahead of time and talk to them about it. So like I said before, have a plan for how to react if there is a harassment event happening to you, then have a plan for preparing for if something might incite harassment against you. And then finally, set up an environment that will minimize the mental impact of regular harassment if that might happen to you. This also includes just dealing with general toxicity online, so you might actually not be targeted necessarily, but there are steps to take to manage your mental health with people just being awful on the internet. So what might actually be on a checklist for your plan? For one, you can compile a list of mute words that might be used to get your attention, or that just might be toxic for your mental health in general. You can also have a plan for muting and blocking. Sometimes it's more helpful to mute people so you can't see what they're saying to you, and sometimes it's more useful to block people so they can't quote tweet you uh, and otherwise harass you. Another thing that you can do is plan when to close or limit the ability for people to privately message you or DM you. Um, so if you're going to publish an article or a fact check that on something that's very controversial and your name's going to be on it, you can prepare ahead of time to close your DMs. If you need to keep your DMs open for tips, have a trusted friend or colleague look at them for you, um, or you can wait to look at them after you've had time to recover. You should also coordinate with your manager or team to be aware of and help manage your harassment and your mental health. This may be um, letting them know that you would take a day off uh, or have a light day, or maybe having them uh, take some topics off your plate so you don't have to cover things that might be really mentally distressing for you. If you are concerned about potential safety threats and need to monitor your social media, you should have at least one pre-designated friend or colleague who can monitor your social media mentions. Uh, you should also have a method ahead of time for documenting any potential threats, either to escalate to social media platforms or to law enforcement. And right there I have a guide from PEN America on good documentation practices, and this resource will also be at the end of the presentation. Now, what do you need to manage your mental health in general, so particularly vicarious trauma and secondary traumatic stress? So we'll have an overview of what you can do to protect your mental health in your daily life, especially when you're seeing um, a lot of distressing things sometimes. So what are the things that you can do in your daily life to prepare for and mitigate secondary trauma? Well, the first is work-life balance, and that sounds a little obvious, um, it, but it's important to compartmentalize very deliberately and actually physically. So what does that look like? With COVID especially, it's very important, if you can, set up separate physical locations in your home where you're doing work that could be more distressing or just work in general um, that's separate from your personal life. So the screen that you're looking at or the place on your bed that you're looking at a movie uh, should be different from the space that you're in when you're uh, working. You should also be compartmentalizing with social media. A lot of people have current events on their social media and that contributes to their stress. So make sure that you have a form of socialization that is distinct from places that you see current events. Some people I know actually make separate fun Twitter accounts for just browsing fun things where they only follow, I don't know, puppy Twitter accounts. Um, and it really does help with your mental health. And in those Twitter accounts, you can also mute words that have to do with current events or things that are distressing for you. You can also just designate times that you're offline, where instead you're going to give your friend a phone call, you're going to watch a movie, or otherwise do things that pulls you away from social media feeds. It's also important to seek out community and organizational support if you think you will be exposed to potentially stressful conditions. Um, you should schedule times to meet up and check in with friends who have similar experiences and who you can actually relate to. You can also have structured meeting times and spaces for debriefing with colleagues who are doing work with similar risks. In general, it's important to normalize reaching out to others you know who are working on distressing things and asking how they're feeling. You should remind each other and encourage each other to eat, sleep, 
go outside and take breaks. If you feel like you're already kind of impacted by secondary trauma, it's also important to know strategies for managing that. First, don't take it all on yourself. You will need people who can remind you to take care of yourself, who can help you do things, who can check in on you. Because when you are depressed or when you're going through traumatic experiences, it's really hard to spend the energy to take care of yourself. You should also be prepared to forgive yourself when you fail, either when there's a lapse with work, uh, with self self care, or doing basically all the right things that you're supposed to be doing for your mental health. It's really, really hard to do that when you're going through hardship. So make sure that you aren't hard on yourself when you're not doing those things perfectly. You should also be aware of how much time and emotional energy you're asking from people, especially if you're asking one person a lot, um, and also how much energy you're expending for other people. And that's why it's important to get a therapist. If you can, get a trauma-informed therapist or somebody who's worked with journalists or who's aware of uh, or sensitive to issues that might be affecting you. Mindfulness regulation and grounding exercises are really important as well because it turns out your physical well-being is very connected to your mental health. That's why you should also build routines around exercise, have good sleep cycles, have boundaries with work, go outside, and very importantly, have creative outlets that aren't specifically productive. Um, that could be video games or watching movies or things where you're not really worried about work or being good enough. And it's also important to prioritize physical comfort. So make sure you have a good pillow. Make sure that your chair is comfortable and not giving you pain because that thing kind of wears down on you over time. There are some physical exercises that you can do to actually manage traumatic reactions. So traumatic experiences often cause physical responses and can benefit from grounding exercises and physical interventions. And this works in general for mental health issues. So if you have anxiety, if you have depression, if you're having intrusive thoughts or uh, trouble concentrating, you can do any of these things and they will be very helpful. Physical release activities have to do with movement, muscle relaxation, and releasing tension. Meditative techniques are really good for mindfulness, and so that involves a lot of breathing exercises. And there's also the 5-4-3-2-1 coping technique. This technique is really good if you have anxiety, if you're overwhelmed, or just having trouble concentrating. You should have a list of physical things that you can do, like an actual list, I love lists, uh, like walking on a carpet and concentrating on how it feels on your feet or smelling something strong like aromatherapy oils, um, like lavender, or eucalyptus, and ideally something that you like the smell of, or even having some gum that you like the taste of so that you can put it in your mouth and, and concentrate on that flavor. You can use these moments basically to check in on yourself and ask yourself, like, have I eaten? Have I slept? How am I feeling? And what can I do to make myself feel better? It's very easy to get distracted and not realizing there are a million different things making you feel like crap. So getting that first step down of asking yourself how you feel is super important to do on a regular basis. Anyway, before I wrap up, I want to acknowledge that organizational industry and community port is still pretty hard to find. There's a limited awareness that these experiences are actually real trauma and they're still not taken seriously or supported as serious health issues. So again, it's really important to help each other by learning, sharing, and discussing organizational resources for supporting volunteers and staff who may be exposed to secondary trauma and making it not just acceptable, but expected to do these things and advocate for these things. If people in your organization, your professional community, or even if your friends and family don't understand or don't take it seriously, or just tell you that it shouldn't bother you, you aren't alone. Uh, this happens all the time. I hear it after every time I give a talk on something like this, and it's important to look to each other if you can. Okay, finally, finally, recognize the good that you're doing. It's super easy to get bogged down in all the negativity with the misinformation, the invisibility of your work, human suffering, and the devastating consequences that you see every day. Um, you know, regardless of feeling like you're making mistakes, you know, if you're scared of being less productive or if you're not up to snuff, you don't really get to see how much you're helping people, but you're helping a lot of people, especially given that you're in a program like this. 
when you see positive impact or somebody saying positive your way, whether it's a coworker, whether it's a comment online, if Facebook took something down because of one of your articles, you know, write that down, literally write it down or type it out, print it out, save it, take screenshots and make sure to look at it and look at it on the regular because that's the impact that you're having and it's really easy to forget. Like I said before, there are resources at the end of the presentation. Here are some online safety resources from PEN America and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. There are also organizational and professional resources. So these are things that you can even give to your manager or leadership to not just demonstrate that this is a serious issue that people are acknowledging, but to actually give them a guide for how to handle it. The last one, developing a standard operating procedure for handling traumatic imagery by the DART Center is really important to look at yourself if you're going to be seeing any bad imagery or seeing just a lot of hateful content. Thank you so much for listening, and please feel free to get in touch, cat at medan.com. It's in the document as well, and uh, good luck out there. <laughs>